Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Signal or Noise. This is episode 23. This is a show where we help investors separate, or at least try to, the signal from the noise. I'm Charlie Bellello, and with me, as always, Peter Malouk. Peter, a lot of interesting topics to run through today. We're going to talk about what I've been calling the everything is awesome market. We're going to debate whether the Fed should cut or not cut. A lot of talk about June, but there's some data moving in the other direction. Cars are a depreciating asset. Again, that might not be surprising to you, but given what went on over the past few years, it might be surprising to some people. Is Apple a monopoly? We're going to discuss the antitrust case. I'm going to give you my idea of how we could simplify the tax code with a one-page tax return, and we'll end, as we always do, with signal or noise talking about the so-called stock pickers market. All right, so let's dig in. Everything is awesome, and this is you could say this is the best of times. There's a lot of different ways to describe it, but the first quarter, Peter, very rare to see this type of upside with very low volatility. I'll just run through some stats before I get your take on this. One of the best starts to a year in history, up over 10%. We had 22 all-time highs. You and I covered this when they hit the first all-time high. Obviously, not something to be afraid of. They tend to be followed by more all-time highs, but not usually this many right. this soon. If we were to continue at this pace, it would exceed the record from 1995. And speaking of 1995, we are on pace, and it's only a few months, obviously. This will likely change, but on pace to beat 1995 in terms of the lowest drawdown for any calendar year. Only 1.7% drawdown maximum in the first quarter. Very unusual to have this much upside with very little downside. You usually have to pay the price as we did last year and we do most years with much bigger drawdowns along the way. I think the average going back to 1928 is around 16% for a calendar year. What's your take on the smooth sailing that's gone on so far today and what should investors be expecting for the remainder of the year? So I think this all happened because the Federal Reserve basically came out and said, hey, we're going to lower rates several times. And when they said it, things were still already strong. You had extremely low unemployment. People still were sitting on a lot of money. They were carrying very little debt. So people were going, normally in a very strong economy, the Fed has to raise rates. They'd done that many times. We didn't go into a recession, inverted yield curve, all these things. And I think people woke up and it's just like Goldilocks. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. Or the Fed's going to lower rates. Let's get the party started. I think we're going to get volatility, not because I'm a mastermind of short-term pr predictions, which I don't believe in, but because it's normal. And I think in a normal year, we see a lot, a lot more volatility. We see a lot more significant drawdown. To your point, this pace is not going to continue. I also think the economy has responded uh, epically strong ever since it was strong to begin with, but then you throw in Powell's three cuts. I think they're not going to be able to cut three times or certainly not at the pace that they thought the market's going to adjust and absorb that. But volatility uh, should be expected. The year is not going to end up the way it's not. It was not going to continue at the current pace, probably under any scenario. So we have this here chart, and I know this is one of your favorites. And we talked yeah. about this entering the year where we said probably the most bullish thing you could point to entering the year was the fact that that strategists were actually so bearish. We had a 20 plus percent year for the S&P last year. And the prediction from the average Wall Street strategist was for a less than 2% gain for the entire year. And here we are in early April, S&P 500 already up over 10%, exceeding that year end target by over 8%. Is this to be expected or is this just another example that these strategists can't forecast the future whatsoever, and they should probably get out of that game of trying to do so. Strategist predictions are completely, totally worthless. No one should ever make a decision based on a prediction anybody has over a one-year period of time. Uh, no one knows. Uh, and while this chart's interesting, it is one of my favorites. I, I, you know, they could still be right. Right, the market can go down. The the ten percent's not locked in. That we didn't just like hit a button and lock it in. We could end the year, the market could drop uh, more than 10% um, from here. So we don't know the outcome, but you know, looking at one quarter and seeing that uh, the, the annual expected return uh, has already exceeded everybody but one analyst in this in this group, it just it, it doesn't make the point of how strong the market is. It makes the point of how worthless these predictions are. 
Right. And in terms of they could still be right, the problem is, as you know, they don't just stick to these targets. As the market goes up, they raise them. So every day we're hearing a different bank right. raising their target for a year at. So now they're at the point where they're getting closer to where the S&P is currently. So if there is a correction, they'll be forced to cut it. And just an absolutely ridiculous game to play. They'll continue to play it because people like that idea of certainty that some, there's someone out there that knows where the market is going to be in the future. And just by throwing darts, you, one of them you would think would be right. But as we've noted the last two years, no one's been close. The S&P 500 finished way above all of the strategist predictions in 2023 and 2022. Obviously, a down year, it finished well below it. But in terms of corrections, what should people be expecting? This is an important chart to just kind of keep in mind here. Almost every single year, you have a 5% pullback at some point in time. Usually, you have three to four of them. I looked at data going back to 1928. The average year has three to four of them. Some years have way more. You just have a ton of volatility. Obviously, we saw that in 2022 most recently. It's very unusual to have a year like 1995, but not impossible. There is nothing that's impossible. So people... This, this is a, a very important point. People who are coming into the air saying, I'm just going to wait for a correction before I get invested. And we talked about that as one of the primary reasons people keep cash on the sidelines. They say, I'm just going to wait for a correction. Well, that correction, when it comes, it might still be above the point where you started waiting. So that's a very da dangerous game to play and why you should keep your investments automated. You're always coming into the market every couple of weeks, regardless of what it's doing. So if you're thinking about what to do, you got cash on the sidelines or you're worried about the correction coming, we can help you with all that creative planning, all 50 states, over 300 billion in assets under management advisements. Take a look at the show notes for a link to set up a call or an in-person meeting. So second thing I want to talk about, Peter, to cut or not to cut, this is the debate for this year. It's the big debate. I think in markets, you were saying that one of the reasons you think the market's doing so well is that expectation that we're going to get those three rate cuts. So perhaps if that doesn't happen, that could be the source, I think, potentially right of that first volatile event. So I put out this tweet and one of these things I think doesn't go with the other. You tell me <laughs> if I'm missing something here. We have S&P 500, Dow, NASDAQ, all-time highs, hitting it every few days, home prices, record highs. Bitcoin, crypto going crazy again. Unemployment rate still below 4%. Inflation, which is what they're supposed to be targeting. They want to get to that 2%. We've now been above it for 35 consecutive months. So we're still not close to that 2% target. And yet the Fed is still expecting to cut rates three times this year with the first cut coming in June. Does that number six seem a little bit ridiculous given one through five? Yeah, obviously they don't go together, and I think it, you know if we if we don't get a natural pullback between now and June, it would not surprise me if they cut but adjust their guidance or say they're going to cut but delay it. You, you can't with everything that's happening, especially if the pace somehow continues. I mean, if you see one through five continue on this pace, there's just no way um, it they don't go together. And I think we're starting to see the Fed's language change. It's not that changed completely, but they're starting to prep the market uh, that they won't be probably going with the three cuts. Yeah, and we should remind people we come. You know, we we did a show in early January where the market was expecting six to seven rate cuts this year, and you said absolutely not. That's not going to happen. The first one was expected to happen in March. Yeah. Obviously, that didn't occur. So these expectations were extremely dovish entering the year. And now the market's kind of right in line with what the Fed is saying at three cuts. But just a, uh, my broader point in terms of inflation, and people can debate whether we're going to get back to 2%. Hopefully we will. Obviously, that's a, that's a good goal to have. But my point has been, if you look at even the last one year, two year, three years, we're talking about above, well above 2% average. And so even if we got back to that 2%, Peter, that doesn't mean that the average inflation rate is 2%. It just means over the past year, we're at 2%. So a better goal in my mind, the Fed doesn't seem to be listening to this, would be 
getting back to a 2% average. So having below 2% inflation for a period of time, they absolutely don't seem to agree with that. The absurdity, if you think about it, let's say we have 2% in year one, we have 100% in year two, and then we go back to 2% in year three. Is that 2% inflation? Of course not. And I think that's what people are feeling. And if you look at a lot of the sentiment going on, people are feeling, and you've talked about this accumulated inflation. So even though the rate has gone down, you're talking about built-in price increases 20, 30, 40% in a short period of time. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, we need we need not just get inflation down to two. It needs to be sustainable. I mean, people have to believe there's a path to that being sustainable. And right now, I mean, look, we I think everyone is pleasantly surprised that we've gotten to this point with inflation somewhat getting in the range of under control without going into a recession uh, while doing it. And so that the the probability of getting there without a, a catastrophe has greatly improved, but it's not done yet. It's not done yet. And if if it's working so well in terms of it's moderated the rate, and it's certainly not hurting financial markets or the economy, why the rush to cut it would be my... Because there seems to be more downside if inflation starts moving in the other direction than upside. And if we look at... Uh, what Powell's been saying, as you said, language changing all the time. He's still saying there's room for the Fed to cut, but he's not definitively saying it's going to happen right in June. If the data starts moving in the other direction, I think he's leaving room to push it to July or September. And perhaps maybe we only get one cut this year, perhaps we get none. And I think if we look at the actual inflation data the last two months, 0.3% increase in January, 0.4% increase in February, and we, when we get that inflation report next week, I think it's going to surprise a lot of people because we're likely to see it move up to around 3.4%. So moving in the wrong direction for the Fed, the markets will be interesting to see how they adjust to that and how the Fed kind of uh, dismisses that report when it comes out. And the big reason for that is that we're seeing commodity price pressures starting to come back, right? The price of gas, highest we've seen since last October. Crude oil is moving higher again. So these pressures that were helping bring inflation down last year are now moving in the opposite direction. And if we look at those expectations, as we said, entering the year, market was saying seven rate cuts, unbelievably dovish. Now the market's saying three right in line with the Fed. And very likely, I think, after we get that C CPI report and then we hear the Fed reaction to that, they might be more comfortable pushing this back to, let's say, July or September. And why not at this point? If they've gotten this kind of Goldilocks situation where the economy is doing well, inflation has come down, unemployment stays low, why not keep the status quo? And there's a lot of daylight between now and the next Fed meeting. It, it seems like it's tomorrow, but a lot can happen, especially with what we see happening in the Middle East and, um, and the election coming up. And there's a lot of headlines that can change things very, very quickly. So we're, we get a correction between now and then. I mean, correction doesn't sound like a big deal. Average correction, though, as we were talking about, is 14, 15%. That's 6,000 points. That can change sentiment very, very fast, sure. even though it's completely normal. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens between now and that next meeting. So let me ask you, if the Fed does end up cutting in June, and let's say they do three cuts, but the data, inflation data is still above 3% and not, moving towards their target. And like you said, it's not, doesn't appear to be sustainably moving to 2%. Do you think that part of the reason they're doing that would be because the national debt, now we have over a trillion dollars in annual payments and that continues to rise? Or is it because we have an election coming? There's some people saying that a rate cut would help the incumbent party. Do you think any of those things could be factors outside of what they're saying, which is, of course, they're just focused on employment and inflation data? Well, I mean, there's there's no question that the Federal Reserve Chair at all times is arguably, if not the most important person in the world, the second most important person, because they definitely can impact an election. If you look at, say, the George Bush Sr., um, he had the highest approval rating in the history of recording approval ratings for U.S. presidents. That was back with the first Iraq war. And um, and um, interest rates rose, 
the economy softened and he got blown out. And read my lips, no new taxes. That's right. But before <laughs> then and after then, presidents have been very paranoid and supposedly the Federal Reserve's independent. There is a strong contingent that thinks that Powell will not raise rates because it could then have a market impact, an economic impact that could swing the election. I think they're probably pretty independent and probably want to stay out of the elections for the most part. I do think the national debt is a very, very big factor. We we now have a real problem. It's, it's something that cannot cannot be ignored. The trajectory is insane. And the United States is now at the mercy of this debt. The current pace cannot continue. And part of it is how big the debt is. Part of it is how much it is growing. And part of it's what the monthly payment is. If you have a house and you have a lot of debt and, you're, and your mortgage is 2%, well, you're probably in a better spot than if it's 6%, 7%, 8% keeps going up. Um, we have a, a big, big problem because the percent that we are, the amount of money that the U.S. taxpayer owes just to make interest payments is now become bigger than the other parts of the debt for the first time in our history. This is exactly how households and businesses go bankrupt. And so I do think that one of the things that the Fed's going to have to do ultimately is find a way to get rates down and kind of in a way get this debt refied, right? Get most of this debt to be long-term, low-paying interest so they can inflate their way out of it as they've done in the past. I do think that's a factor. Yeah, it's hard not to believe that they're not looking at that long term. And the the interesting thing, though, is you can make the case that with high interest rates, it will eventually force some discipline in terms of slowing the rate of growth. We've, we've done $600 billion in additional borrowing in three months this year. So yeah. it's, it doesn't appear to be slowing. Yeah, I don't think democracy lends itself to good fiscal management. Obviously, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not against democracy. I think it's wonderful. But I'm but when you have someone who's in office can put whatever debt they want on the books and they are not the ones facing the consequences, well, I mean, of course, sure. I mean, I'll support all my constituents and all the industries I want to support and who cares if I go into debt because it's going to someone's going to pay for it 10, 20, 30 years from now, right? Obviously, it's it's easier to get elected. It's easier to get what you want. And it's easier to pay back all your constituents if you can write a check to anybody you want without consequence, because the consequence is going to be 5, 10, 50 years down the road. And so in a democracy, you solve things when there's a crisis. The pain has to be more than the pleasure. Well, today, there's more pleasure from spending than there is pain, because there is no pain today. The pain is in the future. In a democracy, to flip it, where an imminent crisis, where everyone can see the pain, then you will try to solve the problem, and that's kind of how we do things in America. We wait, and we're just we're just absolute not there yet. crisis, we're right? Not participating. It's, yeah, in that all the pain. votes we have at midnight on the deadline. That's because that's how democracy works, right? You have to go. Yeah. They, they'd be able to go back to their constituents. And go well. Yeah, yeah. I raised taxes, or yeah, I, I changed this or that, and you don't you don't like it, but the world was going to end otherwise, so I saved us. That's how it has to work, and that's how it has worked. For you know, generationally here. Yeah, no question. And there's no participation, right? And that, that 200 billion, the average person, they're not seeing that, right? You're not, they're not raising the taxes to pay for debt at this point. They're not taking away anything to try to save money on something else. So, so far there's been no consequences, which was why <laughs> there's no pressure. It's like you said, more pressure for the politician to stay in power. And if we look at the Fed as in a similar vein, this is what I've always argued. They're always going to have that similar similar bias, right? They're not borrowing money, but they're the bias is going to be to print money and to keep rates more stimulative, because while they're in power, that will make them look That's better, right? right? Yes. So they're not foolish, right? They're still incentivized by those same things, which is in terms of in the short run making things look better and let the next Fed chairman worry about the problems that's creating. Okay, cars are depreciating assets again. That might seem absurd because <laughs> everything we learned about cars, right? There's that old saying, you buy a car, you drive it off the lot and it's immediately it's down 10%, right? Well, all that changed over the past few years for a brief moment in time. We have this quote from Elon Musk. If you buy a Tesla today, I believe you are buying an appreciating asset, not a depreciating asset. Obviously, prone to hyperbole, Elon Musk, but right. he wasn't wrong for a brief moment of time. We had people flipping Teslas like houses. They were essentially buying a Tesla because there was so much demand and immediately they could resell it in the secondary market. 
for a profit. And that went on for a period of, of months, as you, uh, you can see here in the chart, where the normal course of action for used cars to go down in price. And here we saw used car prices just go absolutely bananas in 2021 and 2022. Then they finally peak in the middle of 2022. And since then, we have what I would say is normal. And it's more than uh, typical for a used car. Tesla's gone down way more. And that's because it's cut the prices of its new car significantly. So they're cut prices 20, 30% on its new car. What is that going to do to the used car value? It's going to go down. But as we know, <laughs> this is what should happen with a car because it becomes less value. It's lifespan. It's a depreciating asset. And uh, this to me is uh, rather than looking at this as a bad sign, this is a good sign. You don't want to have a situation where used cars of prices are going up because of all the supply chain con uh, constraints that we had and because of that massive inflationary spike. So ultimately, I think this is a good thing. It's been difficult for Tesla in terms of profitability, in terms of cutting prices, it's hit its margins. But to me, this is a good lesson for <laughs> anyone young out there thinking, if your car is in a collectible car that you're putting in your garage and you're not driving, it's going to go down in value over time. Yeah, I think if, when they're 100 years from now, when they're looking at these sorts of charts, there's going to be an asterisk and it's going to say COVID. And then there's going to be an explanation of, of what happened. The people are in their houses, they're piling up money, they come out with more money than ever. And there's less cars because a lot of cars require chips. Those chips were not not being delivered because of the supply chain. So the car market was a perfect example of what was happening on a bigger level across many industries, which you're missing one part because of the supply chain, you have that with people with a bunch of cash and record demand, more demand, less supply, you're gonna have a spike in prices. And this was one of the very big problems coming out with COVID is a lot of things that were normally supposed to go down in value were going up in value. This is a sign of a healthy economy. The supply chain's under control. The cars have the chips they need. They've got all the parts they need. They're being delivered. People aren't sitting on as much uh, abundance of cash, and you're starting to see normal supply and demand work itself out. And this is huge for anyone who is waiting. And I talked to a lot of people waiting to buy a used car because it was crazy. It was you're essentially knew you're you're overpaying. Right. This is good news. I mean, sixty seven thousand nine hundred. Now you're down to thirty one thousand five hundred. It's over fifty percent decline in the price of a Tesla, which used to be a huge premium you would have to pay to buy a Tesla. Now it's getting closer to the average price of a used car in general, which is around 27,000 and change. And at some point, if this continues, that they could actually converge. Now, what has this done for Tesla stock in terms of cutting the prices? It's They made a bet, Peter, saying with high interest rates, it's going to be very difficult because since 80% of people finance the cost of a car, it's going to be difficult for people to buy these cars. And we're going to try to continue to deliver and produce these cars by cutting the cost of them way more than any other company. And the short-term impact of that has been a huge decline in the net income for Tesla, margin compression. And what we're seeing here today, in my view, is a good lesson for any story stock that trades at a high valuation. Even if it has a strong run over a 10-year period in Tesla, clearly one of the best performing stocks in the last 10 years, you're going to have these painful, punishing drawdowns over time. And now we're actually in the midst of one of the longest drawdowns for Tesla, second longest in history, down 60% from its peak. And we're talking about an S&P 500 that's hitting an all-time high every other day. What's the takeaway? I know you've talked about Tesla in the past. What's the takeaway for investors? And we could tie this in perhaps to NVIDIA today. People are thinking the same. Growth rate is going to stay high forever. Valuation is justified and so on and so forth. I, this was repeatedly my take a few years ago. I, I got to go back and like dig up those tweets where I said, this is you know overvalued. It's going to come down. And I mean, I was put on blast. <laughs> uh, but my take then was, look, I mean, I, I view Tesla the way I view NVIDIA today. Brilliant lead. I think I think 100 years from now, when we're when there are no one on this earth will be here, but a hundred years from now, when other people are reading books about this period of time, well, let's let's even go a thousand years from now. So if, if the world is still spinning, the earth is still spinning a thousand years from now, there might be one or two names from 
the billions and billions of people on earth that show up in a history book and Elon Musk will be one of them. That is how unbelievably brilliant and innovative and bold he is. And Tesla is a great example of that. He has, I mean, if Tesla's success is the whole market's going to look, whether it's five years or 50 years from now, all cars will be driverless. All cars will be electric. He will have done more for climate change and for the number of deaths on the road and productivity and quality of life than anyone else that's on planet Earth right now. And on top of this, he's got the boring company. He's got the, I mean, SpaceX. The guy's unbelievable, right? What Tesla has, though, is a head start. So I view a head start as very different than a moat. In other words, every car company is going to be able to do this. Every car company is going to do this. And that's why the sales to earnings ratio made no sense. Now, the second thing that hurt, hurts Tesla here is the adaptation is turning out to be much slower than everyone expected. It's so getting hit on both ends, right? There's more competition and adaptation is lower than expected. And then you can throw in the factor of like, how much does the market not like that he's a little bit crazy, right? And so I think you put those three things together, it's really hurt the stock price. I'm not surprised by this at all. We're going to see something like this with NVIDIA. It might you know, quadruple from here. But at 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we got the same exact situation in my mind, which is they're the leaders, they're innovative, they have a huge head start, the pie is going to expand. So even when competition comes in, it will work for a while, but then at some point, there will be enough entrance into the marketplace that the PE ratios, the sale ratios, they're all going to have to come down, not entirely back to earth, but into this galaxy, at least into the galaxy that we're operating in. What yeah, uh, what's your take, Charlie? You've, you've mentioned you've you've tweeted about yeah Twitter. the crazy thing with Tesla and I wrote about it in early 2021. Not because I knew that that was going to be the peak, but because I had never seen something like that. A car company, essentially, which it still was at the time, maybe it won't be ten years from now, trading at thirty times sales. And I looked yeah. at this stock is up a thousand percent in a short period of time, and its revenues have doubled. Okay, but that's that leaves a huge gap. And the history of companies that are trading at that type of multiple and not seeing a mean reversion is very, very short. People are arguing NVIDIA's done it and they're gonna continue to do it. Maybe, maybe they'll be the exception to that rule. Um, nothing's impossible. But for you to argue that Tesla was gonna sustainably trade at that price to, price to sales ratio, just to me, made very little sense. Now it's more difficult, right? Now it's trading at, let's say, you know, four times sales. Okay, is that too high? It's way higher, obviously, than Ford and GM. But mm -hmm. if you think long term, it's going to have a bigger share of the market. It's, you know, it's proven to have higher margins before these price cuts. And it's going to innovate in other ways. Perhaps you can justify that. I just, to me, that moment in time was such a speculative frenzy. It was almost no way... Uh, that it, it wouldn't be difficult for invest for investors at that type of valuation. From here, I have no idea. But in the point of Elon Musk, hundred percent agree with that. I'm I'm reading now the biography Walter Isaacson. If anyone uh, is looking for a good read, just fascinating. Takes you through his childhood, a lot of things you didn't know that would what explains a lot of the behavior that you talked about today in terms of his upbringing and difficulties that he had. Uh, but just amazing moving from one company to another and continuing to surprise people and to push forward against kind of against all odds, right? In terms of yeah. pushing through these new technologies. So I, you have I to kind of separate the person from the valuation yeah. and the company. Right. I just finished that book uh, as well over spring break. And I, you know, the, the takeaway for me is just he gets an idea, he just does it. The guy just like everyone tells him something's impossible. He doesn't care and he makes it happen. And it just the founding of SpaceX, just from an idea in his head to where it is today, it's mind blowing. And it just shows you to me, like not just how amazing he is, but how many things don't happen because somebody goes, well, no one's done it before. Obviously, if it was easy, someone would do it. When you look at how SpaceX, he, he just basically sat down on a piece of paper and goes, well, I probably just need this. It probably only costs that much. I What am I missing here? And then he just went and did it, you know? And so I think it's, it's sort, that part is stunning. I interestingly found the book boring, especially for an Isaacson, an Isaacson book. Elon Musk is fascinating to me. Um, I couldn't get into the book, but it does do a great job of really 
showing how quick he goes from idea to multi-billion dollar company over and yeah. over again. I don't know that anyone else has done this as many times as he has, and he's probably going to do no. three or four more. It's unprecedented. Yeah, the book was, I'd say, more formulaic than yes. like story-driven. It was That's more right. like just a timeline of achievements with a little bit of stories you know, in between. Yeah. Um, but still, if you're looking to understand you know, the man, I think it's a, it's, it's worthwhile read. And uh, like you said, the, the SpaceX thing, just crazy, just crazy. And it, yeah, and he continually, I think like we, he made that statement about car prices, appreciating assets. <laughs> like that was a constant thing with him, not just with saying things, but just setting unreasonable goals. And that, pushed a lot of people the wrong way. A lot of people will say, he's like, I, I want this done by next week. And there's no way they could do it by the next week. But boy, did they try their hardest to get it to that point. So there was a different uh, of opinion. I think that's the biggest thing where he was talking about maybe a fault of his or, or whatever, just the unreasonable expectations that he has for himself. And then in terms of everyone else is going to be on board with that kind of idea. Very few people are wired <laughs> yeah. that way. And that he needed to ultimately be in control of a lot of the situations. He wasn't very good at delegating responsibility. He wanted to control the outcome. Okay, perhaps we'll dig into that a little bit more. But this shows you over the last uh, year, Tesla down around 20%, the big autos all up. And if we, we did this a few years ago, Tesla would be so far in the other direction, I would tweet these out. It was just, it was mind boggling how much Tesla had diverged in the opposite direction. And here's just the power of, of mean reversion and Toyota. Interestingly, their big bet has been on hybrids and the demand for EVs is still there, obviously, but it's slower than I think a lot of people expected. And we've, we've seen GM and Ford talk about the higher cost than expected. So a lot of them are pulling back a little bit from that area. So just interesting. Tesla obviously still full on in the EV, but the hybrid seems to be for now the sweet spot and Toyota is benefiting from that. So let's talk about Apple. Big news recently, the Department of Justice did this antitrust suit against Apple, accusing it of monopolizing smartphone markets. There was a number of different uh, points that they made. Here are the big uh, five the uh, blocking innovative super apps, suppressing mobile cloud streaming services, excluding cross-platform messaging apps. So if you've messaged anyone who has an Android phone, you know, you'll notice the different colors and it's not easy to view videos. That annoys a lot of people. Different functionality, diminishing the functionality of non-smart watches. So it's hard to use. I don't know if you can use a, a, a non-Apple a uh, smart watch with your Apple, and you certainly can't use your Apple smart, uh, your Apple watch with uh, an Android phone. And then this is a big one as well, limiting third party digital wallets. So before we get into the specifics, I think, Peter, it's hard to argue that Apple, there isn't some type of monopoly here, but that's the case, I think, for any, you could argue any of the big tech companies. And if you look at Apple, that's kind of been its business strategy to become this all-in-one ecosystem where you're not going to leave to go somewhere else and you can't leave, essentially. So it's it's been their business strategy with the government saying they've gone too far and they have to loosen up in these areas. What's your take on the Apple uh, monopoly and whether, perhaps, I mean, it's going to take years for this to, to, to work its way out, but whether this has uh, any uh, any chance of succeeding in terms of forcing apples to make changes or pay fines. I think it's an interesting spot. I think it's different than a lot of big tech. I think Netflix is considered big tech and I don't think Netflix will be the leader 20 years from now. It, the, the barriers to entry are, are 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 very low. We're seeing all the competitors come in. It's only a matter of time and and what AI will do to that space. I think Tesla has a head start, Nvidia has a head start, but I mean it someday other people will make chips that will do the same thing and and it will be a price war. Apple's different, and it's it's like Microsoft uh, to the extreme. And that once to your point, once you go in that ecosystem, you are in that ecosystem. You are addicted to the ecosystem. The whole point is it's easier and user friendly. And so switching, you're switching your entire environment. And most people spend over ninety percent of their life within um, ten feet of their of their of their phone, right? So this is like a part of your body, right? And when you're using it. 
you're stuck in that ecosystem. Of course, there's compat. You can go to Samsung. You can get another phone. That's they're not a monopoly in that sense. But I think it's definitely true, and I think Apple's gonna have a very hard time arguing that when you're in the Apple ecosystem, you are at the mercy of Apple. And what Apple is is doing is basically saying, like, whatever else you want to do in here, uh, we want you to do it with us. We're not banning the others. We're just making it more difficult to use them, or we're making it more expensive for them to come in here or for you to use them. And those are the kinds of things that you can only do if you've got monopolistic uh, type powers. But the interesting thing is, to your point, that was the Apple business model, which is they took a much higher risk. Steve Jobs made a decision in a world that was open architecture to go, we're not going to do that. We're going to invite you into our world and it's going to be much harder for us to succeed, much higher chance of failure. Um, but we know if we win, we'll win big. Well, they've won bigger, I'm sure, than anyone, including him, ever expected. And now to they're to the point where they're a full-blown platform, and I am certain they are going to lose this case, right? They are they're going to wind up having to open up their systems a lot more. They are still gonna make a fortune. The stock is still gonna do great. Apple uh by itself has more earnings than most countries in the world have. I'd rather own App, the Apple than the economy of most countries in the world. Every single person that creates an app is still going to have to put it on the Apple platform. Might they pay Apple less to put the app on? Maybe, but that's fine. They're still getting thousands of apps a day, every day for the rest of time. So Apple's going to be okay. They're going to lose this and, and there are going to be things that they're going to have to do to open, open up their systems. I think there's a pretty strong case here and they'll, I think you're right. It'll probably be there'll probably be some type of settlement. I think that we we have to kind of break out the different arguments here. I'm not sure the smartwatch thing is that yeah. compelling. I think why would why would Apple make a smartwatch that plays nice with these other phones? I mean, is that a huge deal for a lot of people? Probably not. If they're if you're getting an Apple Apple Watch, you probably have an iPhone already. And you don't care that much about not being able to use it on an Android. Same thing, I think, with the messaging thing. I think the big thing are, are two things. One, the App Store, where you have to go through the App Store. Apple charges a bigger VIG than anyone else. They get 30% off the top of that. And that's the kind of the easiest one, I think, to kind of force them to open that up. And from a consumer standpoint, though, Peter, it's hard. It's a hard one, right? Because you say people love Apple so much that they're willing to pay this premium price. You can buy an Android for, phone for a fraction of the price. And you can put anything you want on there. You could, there's multiple app stores, you know, and yeah, Google will get a piece of their one, but you could put, you, the phone is essentially yours. You could put the software that you want on there. But people have chosen, at least in America, Apple's not the most popular phone worldwide, but in America, so I think it's around 60% market share. They've, they've chosen to buy this premium product with all of these limitations in place. And maybe it's more of a question, not from the consumer standpoint, but ultimately, these competing businesses. So there was that big fight with Epic Games and Fortnite, and they don't want to pay Apple that big. And I guess ultimately, you could say the consumer's paying more because they're char charging. They're charging Apple. The Apple's the middleman is getting a bigger piece. So if they did it outside, let's say th um, you know through uh, through Spotify, they had this recent thing in the EU saying if. Uh, if they were to pay for Spotify standalone, like on their on their website somewhere else outside of Apple, they would get a lower price, right, than they would through Apple. And that makes sense, right? And I think it'll be something like that. But it, it's hard to square that consumer choice with that monopoly. I think it's been such a good, what I'm saying is it's been such a good, helpful monopoly similar to Amazon or similar to Google that cons it's the pressure isn't so much coming from consumers as it's coming from these, obviously, the, the competition that sees this as, as just you know, having to pay uh, this. this wall. Apple's put up this wall, and if you don't pay it, you don't play. That's right. Yeah. It, they've become like, you to do business, you have to use it now. And then it, they are going to dictate the pricing. That's close it's to good, the it's good business market. for yeah. apple right i yeah. mean they've seen they've all this isn't happening in a vacuum too apple's seen growth of smartphones go down i think their revenues are up only two percent over the last year so they're finding other ways to try to maximize profits but in terms of the eu i've mentioned that here 
I think we'll see something like this and ultimately where they either pay a fine or they're forced to loosen up in terms of the Apple marketplace or also Apple Pay is another big issue, right? Where they're kind of forcing you to use their their payment system as opposed to other competing things. So ultimately, I think that's where it's headed. But this is going to take years to play out. What has been the impact on the stock? It's hard to say Apple was going down before this came out, but uh, if we look at the S&P 500 up 10% this year, Apple down 11%. And over the past few years, I think this would surprise a lot of people because we always hear Apple as being one of the tr most tremendous performers. And it has been over the last decade, 20 years, any long time period. But over the last four years, Apple's kind of gone sideways with the market. And similar to Tesla, Apple was trading at a premium price and in terms of earnings or in terms of sales. And now its growth rate has come down and it's kind of we're kind of seeing a mean reversion. It was the number one company in the US for a long time. And now Microsoft has actually surpassed mm -hmm. that. So any lessons from investors uh, from this? I know you said I'm taking Apple over most countries. I would agree with that. But what do you think in terms of investors who have loved Apple, rightfully so, for a long period of time, but now are seeing really the, the first period of underperformance significant of performance that it's in, in years. Yeah, every, two lessons. Every stock at some point is going to underperform for a very, very, very long period of time. You were talking about Microsoft, a decade of nothing, right? literally a decade of nothing. And here we are, Apple, you've got three years, nothing. Um, and it's one of the, these are two of the greatest companies of all time. The other lesson, own a diversified basket of securities. If you own the S&P 100 or 500, um, you had a great year at one point because of Apple. You're having a great year this year. Largely, you can send a thank you note to NVIDIA. You know, quit looking for the needle in the haystack. Buy the haystack. You know, the worst stock in the S&P 500 can only go down 100%. The best stock can go up 10,000%. That's how we see that return get lifted because you own those winners. And we can't tell when the rotation is going to happen. 100%. Okay. I'm going to, I promised last week to give my solution <laughs> to the tax code. Mm. And here, here we go, Peter. I'm going to run you through here. This is what, if I add a magic wand and I just finished doing my taxes, it took obviously way too long. And uh, this is what I would do. No deductions, no credits, no exemptions, no AMT, no loopholes, flat tax on all income. <laughs> and of course uh. that will never ever happen when i was in law school i took a lot of tax classes a, a really interesting subject and i asked the professor at one point well there's a whole business and industry built around you know this complication of the tax so what 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 would happen to this if we actually simplify things and he just laughed like i've never heard anyone laugh before I said charlie that's never ever gonna happen <laughs> who do you think makes all of these rules it's us. It's the lawyers. So it's only uh, going to probably get more complicated. And he was absolutely yeah. uh, right about this. Any of these things do you think that we could work on to simplify the tax code a little bit? You know, I think what's interesting is when, when Trump, the Trump administration raised the deduction, the standard deduction, they kind of made it where there's no deductions for a big part of the population. And it simplified a lot of tax returns. I True. don't know that I, I know I, the answer is no, but I do think there could be things where they change a limitation where this huge percent of the population finds their return become infinitely easier. That part I think is possible. You know, 10 years ago, if you would have made a change like this, we'd have massive unemployment in the tax world. That would not be the case today. There's so much demand for accountants because of all the regulations so many businesses are subject to. There's so many jobs could never have enough accountants to fill them all. If you simplify the tax code overnight, unemployment wouldn't move even by one one thousandth of one percent. Everyone would have a job very quickly uh, somewhere else in the accounting field. Yeah, it's, pro it's probably wishful thinking. I just think there's so much embedded in this in terms of, of lobbying and special interests, right? right? And you get a deduction yeah. for this and a credit for that, but you don't get it for that. And ultimately, that's not a good thing. But like you said, raising that standard deduction has simplified it for a lot of people. I think if they did away with the AMT, that would be a, a great simplification as well. But not going to happen this year. No. Uh, next week, next uh, episode, I'm going to talk about the breakdown in terms of uh, who pays taxes. And that's probably going to upset a lot of people. But 
uh, I think it's something that we need to look at as a country with the national debt going the way it's going. We're either going to have to cut spending at some point or raise taxes. Neither one people want to do today. And we need to take a good look at, at this whole picture here. But my hope, Peter, one day we'll make it very simple. I don't think, interestingly, I don't think this would change the revenue picture whatsoever. I think you could do it in a way where it would be absolutely revenue neutral. Yeah. It's just we've become so accustomed to right. getting these deductions, getting this credit. If you told people you're not going to get a mortgage interest deduction anymore, they they would lose their minds. But as the you said, charitable a lot deduction. of you get rid of the or charitable, charitable deduction, deduction right? They would lose their minds. But a lot of people with that increase in the standard deduction aren't getting it anyway now that mortgage interest deduction and. I don't. Is it are people donating to charity because they're getting a tax deduction? I mean, is that it's a great? I mean, I, it's a good incentive. If there's one good incentive, it would definitely be that. But to simplify things and not having any of this stuff and just say, here's your income, here's the tax you need to pay, end of story. Let's let's all move on to productive stuff. I think that would be an awesome thing. Will not happen probably in my lifetime, but. Uh, I could still hope for that. Okay, let's move on to signal or noise. And this is something, Peter, it's a kind of pet peeve of mine that we always hear. It's a stock picker's market and this manager's doing well or it, it's going to be an environment where finally, even though we know in the long term, this doesn't tend to work out. Finally, it's going to be easier for you to pick stocks. So here's a few headlines. January was awesome for stock pickers why it will be a stock picker's market over the next few quarters, and some stock pickers show active can still beat passive investing. Stock picker's market, signal or noise for the average investor? Always noise. And there's this this idea that like in a, in a bear market, that's when the stock pickers do better. The evidence is the exact opposite of that. They continue to underperform the market. Uh, but basically, the studies in every cycle, right? A bull market, a bear market, a volatile market, a non-volatile market. Stock pickers tend to underperform people that own a diversified basket securities a across multiple asset classes. It's just I don't know that I've ever seen uh, research to the contrary, at least in the last 10 years. No, and it's been particularly difficult for stock pickers. I will say this, Peter. Over the past year, it's been probably more difficult to be a stock picker than any time in history because so few stocks were outperforming the index. And because we've talked about the Magnific this was Magnificent Seven, NVIDIA, all of that driving the gain. So only 24% of S&P 500 members outperforming in February as of February over the prior year. That was the lowest I could find on record, even below 1999, which was obviously another extreme in terms of big tech outperformance. So I think it will be easier, but... That's not to say in the long term, you should be looking for that needle in the haystack. And what we mean by that, we just got an update here. S&P does this every year, showing you the percentage of equity funds underperforming their benchmarks. And what you usually find in a one-year period, there's some that outper uh, outperform, but most of them don't. But actually, the last year was actually much higher underperformance because of that, uh, that factor where so few stocks were contributing. But as you go on in time, three year, five year, 10 year, 15, and you get to 20 years, every single category, it doesn't matter, it's value, growth, small cap, large cap, every single category is over 90% underperforming the benchmark. Absolutely unbelievable stat for anybody thinking, I'm going to pick that fund that's going to do well in the future. And here's the crazy thing. You say, someone might say, well, let me just go through that 20 year period and pick the ones <laughs> that, that have outperformed. The problem is there's no persistence in that performance. As uh, Danny Kahneman, who just passed away, rest in peace, and we'll, we'll do something on thinking fast and slow on the next episode. But he said this, Peter, professional investors, including fund managers, fail a basic test of skill, which is persistent achievement. And the success in any given year are mostly lucky they have a good roll of the dice. Is that being too harsh or did he hit the nail on the head where I think there is some skill, but for the average investor to decipher what is skill and what is luck in a short period of time, that's impossible. That's an unreasonable expectation. That's right. There probably is somebody out there that has that skill. And, and the problem is 
we don't we can't differentiate between skill and luck. So we have to look at the group and we see that no matter what category you're in for a long period of time, over 90% underperform. In any other field, we would say there's no decision making left to be made. I'm going to go passive instead of active uh, in this space. Only in investing does somebody look at that 10% chance and go, I think I, I'm going to go for that. 100%. All right. We'll end it right there. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. We're also available Apple, Google, Spotify, all the podcast platforms. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Signal or noise.